I was working around the chimney, I had to get down to a t-shirt. That's how much heat Air loss was, was actually just like happening around through that the chimney. Yeah. It was like confirming what I was doing. And like, yeah. as, as, as much as I didn't want to do that job, as goopy and messy as it was, and you know, it was just like, got to do this. This is pretty, pretty becoming yeah. pretty clear right now. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast. You know who we are and what we do. Thank you for tuning in to what we feel is the best home building show around. We were just talking about that. Nobody mm. else, nobody else, Brian, no, is putting out this kind of information, if we could toot our own horns. Yeah, I heard a guy trying on the radio this morning. That's why I brought it up. Oh, yeah? Yeah, he wasn't. <laughs> what was he talking about? I, I believe, actually, and I, did, I didn't come in and look this up, but I believe I just caught the beginning of it. And I believe they called it the Project House, his thing, the what? Project House, yeah, which is our thing. Yeah. So don't we own that term? Know, we might have to, might have to send him a little note. But yes, cease and desist. <laughs> send the goons, Rob. Hey, I, it, admittedly, he was I'll on a show it. with some. It was like a no, morning no, no. talk show where the guys were really no, funny, and they were give, they weren't letting him get anything out, you know. So, but yeah, I just I wasn't th- I wasn't overly impressed. Who with, was he? A builder. I don't know. Are we talking I about NPR? I didn't, I didn't last that long with it. No, just some radio, local Connecticut Hip-hop radio station. station. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get my groove on on the way to work. <laughs> groove Pavement. Listen to some Groove Ooh, Pavement. Pavement. Groove pavement. A little known fact yeah. that is the name of Brian's old band. Yep. Yep. I'll put a, what kind of music? I'll put a video on the show page. What kind of music did you guys yeah. play? If you guys yes. would like. Yes. What kind of music did you guys play? It was jazz and funk. And yeah. Can we change our theme song to a Groove Pavement theme song? Absolutely. I got uh, I tons of to. recordings. I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> Je- All right. We're going to make sure Jeff gets uh, yeah. get some food. You know what we haven't done in a long time is a ringtone. We need to, do, we need to <laughs> take a couple of Did we ever do a ringtone? We did it at one point. Didn't we do a ringtone, Jeff? I don't think we ever actually made it available to people, but Jeff created one off of something. I'll dig that up for, too. For I'm, gonna, I'm, Brian, I'm it's super it's confused dryer. right now. It's Brian's what? Dryer. Oh, it was about Brian's dryer. Yeah, the noise it makes. Oh, that's right. You were you were making the noise of what your dryer sounded like. I'm gonna find that. I'm gonna give it to Mike so we can put it on as a wave file on the. <laughs> yeah. Are wave files still a thing? I don't Who know. knows? Oh, we got we should we got to keep it moving. Rob's getting upset. <laughs> He's got to get back to his emails. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so uh, we got. Uh, some some usual questions to talk about today. Um, I, mean, I, I felt like we were having fun, but I guess we can get serious and just dive right in. And, you know, uh, sorry, to, sorry to shut it down. Yeah, just, no, Rob says no fun. Yep, I'm His all editorial of, direction. I'm all about does not the fun. fun. Just let's no. get. We're talking about ringtones and wave files. Yeah, ringtones about home building though. All right. We're just having fun for the audience, Rob. Um, I apologize on behalf of the audience. So just you know, I won't I won't do the whole intro spiel since we're past that, but. Uh, FHB podcast at Taunton.com is where you can send questions and comments and that kind of stuff. Um, Finehomebuilding.com slash podcast is where you can go to get all the show notes. Mike does a, if you guys aren't reading those, they're really funny. It's it's almost like a second show. Our our web producer, Mike writes those up. Yeah, who knew? They're they're really, they're really entertaining uh, (laughs) takes. They're they're almost like a a review of us Mm -hmm. talking. Um, In addition to all the articles and everything that we talk about here, there's, there's so much more that you can, that you can find out about by going to our website. Um, so, uh, oh man, I've been, I, I, you guys remember back to the Mike Pekovich podcast where we were talking about, um, hand planes and, and the, the importance of not just being smooth, but flat. So hand planes getting yes. you flat, samper is getting you smooth. And then, uh, I was working with our, our very own Rodney Diaz, who's our deputy art director. And we were and an awesome woodworker, awesome in his own woodworker. Right? Yeah. And, uh, he uh, he brought in a sample board one day. He's he's working on this big cherry built in, so it's like a shaker style, a lot of doors and drawers. And um, I, I guess what happened, I guess the backstory is that he moved into a new house, and he couldn't fit his old bedroom furniture up the stairway because I think it has like a ninety degree turn, and they just couldn't. They had like a big long thing, and they couldn't get it up there. So um, he parlayed that into convincing his wife that it was finally time for him to build this thing. He's, I don't know how long he's been working on it since that decision was made. But uh, so anyway, he he sneaks down to the shop every once in a while and he works on it. And he brought in uh, a little piece of cherry that he had been working out his finishing routine on. And um, it's basically a combination of starts with some hand planing, um, real quick pass just to, to, to flatten the board, remove all the mill marks from the thickness planer and the table saw and everything. And then he just takes it to an extreme high level of sanding not 
And not in the sense that he spends a lot of time sanding, just that he spends a little bit of time on a lot of different grits in order to take it to a high level. And I was floored by, and then he wipes on a, a coat or two of, of, you know, regular Minwax polyurethane wiping, uh, wipe, wipe on polyurethane. And I was floored with how smooth it was. Really? Like I've never, it's like, yes, that's what you've always wanted your finish to feel like. And so, so, uh, you know, that, that seeing that, and, and then we took some photos of his process and then that combined with Mike Pakovich talking about the hand plane, I finally just broke down and pulled the trigger and bought a, a nice Lee Nielsen uh, low angle jack plane, which is just like stupid expensive, <laughs> but, but so nice. And that, and the first shaving, you know, I, I got it out, got out of the box and um, I should note that I've started by trying desperately to use a Stanley Sweetheart, which is half the mm. price. It's like uh, 125 bucks. Same type of plane. Same type of plane. And they came out years ago. I, I don't remember the exact year. I want to say like 2011. Maybe it was later than that. I don't know. Um, it was supposed to be like their kind of Stanley's revival. Like they have really nice. Sweetheart. Higher end line, right? Yeah, higher end line. Yeah. Yep. They were, and, it, and Sweetheart stuff, it, Sweetheart came from like this little heart-shaped icon they had printed on their irons and, and that kind of stuff like that you know the plain irons and so they brought that back years ago thinking well we can get into our high-end woodworking market again and they used to own it i mean like they're like the benchmark the old planes that everybody used to mm -hmm. measure against so i tried really hard to make that cheaper one work because i don't want to be like you know i have to buy the most expensive thing but um there's an there's there's like this flaw ground into the tool where where the blade will never be straight. Hmm. It will never be, it will never give you perfectly flat cuts. And it was like, you could, you could, you could compensate for it by grinding the blade at a slight angle so that it would be a little bit higher on one side. Basically what you want to avoid is the blade sticking down and it's leaving track marks on the edges. So you could grind it a little bit to compensate, but I was just like, I, don't know, I can't make it work. And it was, and so I just finally got the good one which is twice as expensive, you know, tuned up the, the edge of the blade, put it in there. And I like the first pass was like the most perfect thin shaving I'd ever taken. You felt my, like a pro. Yeah. It was, <laughs> and it's just, I really feel like it's, I don't want to make it like the tools make you better at what you're doing, but it is nice every once in a while to really, I think, honor the stuff that you do by investing in high quality things that are a pleasure to use. Sure. I mean, and, and you just described a tool that doesn't work, doesn't work and can't really do its job without, you know, without actually sort of, but millions of people use it and, yeah. and they're, and, and they're, it's, it's got flaws, but it's still, yeah. I mean, it, it doesn't do the job that it should do yeah. as well as it should. Yeah. So here I have a question All and, right. and you know, I haven't done any, any woodworking where I've hand planed surfaces. How those that, kitchen cabinets coming to Brian? that degree? Um, so my question is this, and I know the shavings you're, you're intended to take off as little as possible just to flatten the surface. Right. And the shavings are, you know, can be microscopic. Yeah. But is there any concern when you're hand planing about actually changing the dimensions of the board and not actually knowing what dimensions you're getting to? Yeah, I'm not. I, it's funny. I have the same question and I don't. Every new level I go to in woodworking, and by the way, in carpentry, I mean, it's because I plan on using this tool. I posted about it when I got it, and and the thing I posted about was it used to be commonplace that every builder, every carpenter had hand planes. Mm -hmm. It's not a woodworking thing. Right. Carpenters used carpenter hand thing. planes, and yeah. that faded away, I don't know when, decades ago, but there's no reason it shouldn't be brought back. They're so useful, and it's just as important for finished carpenters to have dead smooth surfaces and really high quality results that you're never going to get from from a machine because mm -hmm. it just can't that's the trade-off um so my point in saying that is that i'm still learning stuff mm -hmm. like now i feel like i know how to finally know how to sharpen it the right way and mike Pekovich was a huge help on the podcast when we were talking about the tips and he referred us all to an article in fine woodworking that was really helpful um and just the frustr and I had old hand planes, you know, like that El Cheapo hand planes. And I would try them a few times and I would be like, this is so annoying. Like, this doesn't work. I'm never, and I just goes right back into the cabinet and it never gets touched. And now I feel like I finally have a tool that I 
will actually help me because I spent a little more money. And I really, it won't make me a great woodworker or carpenter, but it's going to help me get there because it's enabling me to. But it raises new unknowns. Yeah. Like now I'm learning much more about grain direction and I'm learning more about proper sharpening and how much of a difference it can make. And I'm learning about um, uh, just you know, the care and, and use of that tool, you know, making sure it doesn't get rusty, making sure it's, it's protected and oiled and waxed so that it runs smooth and, um, how to adjust it so that it gives me the best results. And also just now how to adapt my work to include it in the sequence. Mm -hmm. Like, so what do I, what do I, does my board coming out of the thickness planer have to be based on how much I'm going to then take off? I don't know. I, I'm not, yeah. I'm not there yet. I don't yeah. Um, I know that I've seen like when Rodney was doing it, he was doing like shaker style panels and he was, he would hand plane the edges of it and then he would be checking those and he's kind of sneaking up on like, okay, I'm not going any farther with this yeah. because it's getting a little looser than I want. So I think, but I don't know, you know, is that like I add a 32nd before I, or a 16th or, yeah. cause you certainly don't want to be using that tool to try to remove stock to like. You know, I need to get from a quarter to an eighth. So let's get out the hand right. plane. <laughs> well, it was interesting uh, to, to – I, you know, I have that story. We've talked about this story a few times coming up with uh, Ben Brunick about restoring window sash. Yep, yep. And, you know, one of the th cautions he mentions in there is that if you, if you are doing a lot of repairs or just trying to get the window sash prepared for uh, primer and paint, if, if you do – an a lot of sanding you can actually change the dimension of the sash yeah, yep. and now it's going to be sloppy when mm. you put it back in the window and then that was a wake up when i read that yeah. from ben i had never thought of that yeah. like oh don't take off the paint in a way that's going to lead to a lot of sanding right because that sanding is going to lead to problems right and it's yeah. just like oh yeah yeah because you'll make the sash too thin right yeah and it's just like you know, the only way you figure that out yeah. is to screw it up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Is that a, the first Lee Nielsen plane that you've had? Or do you I have, have a block plane. That, that sits in your pouch, right? Your tool I don't, belt? I don't really. Sometimes, yes. What, uh, what plane heavy. is that? It's really heavy. Okay. Uh, it's like a number six. Do you have the web page open? I think it's like a 62 and a half or a 60 and a half or something. It's just a low angle adjustable mouth block plane. Oh, it is adjustable mouth? Yeah. And it's, it's an expensive tool also. Uh, I bought that years ago when I took a woodworking class coming out of college. Mm -hmm. Garrett Hack, um, who was a frequent author for woodworking, said, you know, you, you should consider getting this. And back in those days, it was like, I was just getting into it. And it was like, yeah, 60 and a half. It's like any, any new hobby that I pursue, the best part about it was gearing up. It yeah. was like rock climbing, I need all the best stuff. Yeah. Hey, woodworking, I need all the best stuff. And it was so, it was, it's pretty pricey. Yeah, what so is it? it is a number sixty and a half adjustable mouth block plane. It's one hundred sixty five bucks. Yeah, but I, is it? Do you find it? So you've had like this revelation with the jack plane. Did you have a similar revelation when you were when you first bought that block plane? And I think I'm starting to have a revelation about it now because I never okay. knew how to use it right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it, it's a combination of of um, practice and knowledge and learning how to set it up. It, it's not going to make you better, but it can allow you to be better. Uh, and, and the block plane seems to be the only thing that carpenters still hang on to. It's like, that's the one that, that's the one that didn't die out for some reason. And do you think it's just that now we have like better table saws and we have routers yeah. and like all the things I that we so. would use the planes for just kind of went away? I think so. Because, I mean, people were still... Like router planes and all I that guess. kind of stuff I mean, I guess and people, all those molding profiles and all, you know, like you know, I'm sure everybody has those old wood, um, yeah planes that have all those different little OGs and yeah. profiles that you would then essentially route. And not only that, but they would make their own hand planes. Yeah. Like that was standard fare. Yeah. And I guess it, I didn't really think about it, but they didn't have sandpaper. Like at a, you go a certain distance back and it was like sandpaper. No. <laughs> right. You have a hand plane and then a scraper. Yeah. And then you're ready to fit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hand hewn. Yeah. It's because we didn't have anything better. <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't know. It's interesting. So you know, it's the holidays coming up and, you know, re it's two shows in a row. There's two shows. Well, the, you know, the holidays. Yeah. Those holidays. Um, those, those holidays. So, you know, reinvest in your craft and, and help somebody else reinvest in their craft and get, it's like, uh, did you listen to the, the show, you know, that we, we weren't on, we did the, the podcast takeover when, uh, Matt, the two Matts and, uh, Patrick did the tool episode mm -hmm. and Matt Kenny gave the advice of, 
uh, who's a, you know, in case anybody missed that show, he's a, one of the editors at Fine Woodworking, and he gave the advice of don't try and buy somebody a tool that you think is kind of, is really cool or maybe it's kind of gimmicky. Just look at the tools they have and then get them a really high-quality version of mm-hmm. something that they use. And he's and he recommended like even if it's like a, a combination square, yeah. like for layout or like a, a tape measure or something like not a gimmick, just a really good version of something. And I think that's really great advice for anybody looking to shop because yeah, you know. Anyway, so that sorry for a little diatribe there. I was excited about my new purchase and uh, what's going to come from it. Oh, and also you're going you'll be able to see that article from Rodney in the next issue so it'll be on newsstands in january i think people are going to be shocked at at what grits we're talking about here i think people are going to be shocked (laughs) it to keep in mind with the article that there's a video too and it's a real-time video it's not it's meaning i I, that i filmed him doing this in like it wasn't like a sped up time lapse yeah it wasn't sped up the whole process takes minutes Mm -hmm. to get to the smoothest thing you've ever seen it's not it's not a it's just yeah it's just better. I don't know. I like it. I'm 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 happy that that we finally get some some something from. Has he has he magazine. applied this technique to other uh, other woods other than cherry? You know, we did try some other stuff. Yeah, because then once yeah. once we kind of saw the results, we started just grabbing yeah. different pieces of wood and going, "Oh, let's see what walnut would look like." And, oh, cool. red birch. And you know how Rodney gets. You hear yeah. there's a <laughs> did you guys hear there's a rosewood shortage? I did not hear that. Yeah, it's short of, of, of rosewood. I went I to buy that. red oak the mm-hmm. other day, and I was, like, blown away by how much it costs. And I can't remember. Really? I can't remember if it's it, – I don't know if it's changed. I was like, I got to take a picture of this and just kind of keep an eye on it because I – my house has a lot of red oak in it or a lot of oak in it. And so I started trimming out my bedroom in red oak. And then when I never finished it, I am now going back and trying to finish it. And I'm like, oh, my God, like a one by – six or one i think it was one by eight by eight or one by six by eight was like 30 bucks mm. i was like man this is gonna be like and then i was like well it's so expensive because it's the big box store i'm gonna buy it from my hardwood supplier and just you know resaw it or whatever and i look at that price and i'm like no the board foot price is working out to be about the yeah. same it's not but i know i hadn't heard about rosewood <clears throat> yeah i actually that's i've heard about that a while ago um from a I think from a guitar manufacturer yeah. who put out a statement that said they're not going to use it anymore for that reason. Yeah. It's commonly used, you know, on guitars for fingerboards. Yeah. For fingerboards, yeah. It was interesting. I heard this little spot. They uh, they it's played a Martin do- guitar, one that was mm. built with rosewood, and then one was built with mahogany. And they had like the engineer explaining all the, those those tone differences and stuff. It was really cool. Mm. But yeah. yeah, it's a that's a African tree. Not sure where rosewood is being harvested from. I, I always thought it was South American. Because mm. isn't there isn't there right. one particular like Brazilian rosewood? Mm. I don't know. If you're relying on me for geography, we're going. <laughs> that's, a, that's a whole different podcast. <laughs> uh, I don't even know where you are right now, yeah. do you? <laughs> I'm east of somewhere, north <laughs> of somewhere else. Uh, you guys want to do some questions? Sure. John writes, hi, guys. I recently went into my attic and noticed that the nails poking down through the roof sheathing have condensation on them. My first reaction was a roof leak, but I don't see anything. Is this a venting issue? Um, yeah, John knows. John knows that uh, here at the Fine Roof Venting Podcast, we, we talk a lot <laughs> you about know what we like to talk about. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, <clears throat> initial thoughts by anybody? Well, I think we can start off with sort of – start off maybe with an overarching statement that it – that just to explain what in general what's happening here before we get to the specifics of what might be causing it, right? Take it away, Brian. So in in probably likely what's happening is that there's moisture coming from somewhere, getting into, into his attic, and the, the nails, because they penetrate through the roof, they're cold, mm-hmm. colder, probably the coldest in their metal, probably the coldest surface in the attic, and so that's where... That moisture is condensing. Correct. This is not like if all of his nails are <laughs> yeah. wet. This is not likely a leak from somewhere. <laughs> yeah. So from each nail penetration. Yeah. So that yeah, yeah. that water that mo- <clears throat> is, well, you know, is he didn't likely he, condensation. He didn't say all the nails. Well, I guess he did say the nails poking down through the roof sheathing. But I, this can be localized too. I need to get to your point of where is the moisture coming from. Right. It could really <laughs> pop up in in just small spots. Oh, right above the moisture right source. Right above or the moisture source. Right. Yeah. So, so that, what could so be can, this? Yeah, what are the common thing? moisture so, sources? So now then? The, the question really is, where where is this moisture coming from? Um, well, certainly, uh, so this is super common. Like, you're, this is not. Um, 
it's not anything to seriously worry about. It seems like there's, these are easy, uh, these are tackleable. Is that a word? It's not. This is a project you can tackle. You can fix this. So don't freak out. Your roof is not leaking. Well, for, first of all, how big of an issue is this? Obviously, you don't want condensation in your in your roof. Um, I, I think this and is, your assembly. Like, this is an issue that is worth yeah. fixing. Like it should be right. addressed. It's yeah. not a. I agree. I'll get around to that. Yeah. I yeah. mean, you should you should tackle this because the OSB sheathing. I'm and sure. Good, I'm yeah, guessing. And, I'm sure it's going to be OSB sheathing. Yeah. And, so it's going to wick up into that, yeah. or if it's if it's actually enough that it's dripping, it's going to drip down onto your right. Whatever, and your insulator. Whatever's what, yeah. Whatever's floor. under that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so there's several different sources for this, and guys, correct me if I'm missing any. Um, the, the common ones that I always think of is uh, uh, I look for a bath fan that's vented directly into the attic, which was, I mean, we laugh at that now, but that was just standard practice. Oh, yeah. Like, it wasn't like they, those guys were taking shortcuts. It was just the attic is is considered outdoor air. It used to be considered outdoor air to builders. So right. we're going to dump moisture from out of the house into the attic. And or and even sometimes when it's vented to the soffit. Yeah. And if the roof is vented at the soffits, yeah. that's just being it's just circling right back in. Right. Because right. that's what roof venting is intended to do. Pull air <laughs> in from the soffit. So yeah. I mean that that was common in you know, to just run that bath vent, you know, you like the flex duct right across the attic floor and just drop it right into the soffit area. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Um, it could also be moisture coming from your house, like for, just from the living air, living from area air down leaks. from air leaks air between leaks, that yeah. floor plane or ceiling plane. A second so, floor. Um, I mean, would you go so far as to say that you should just address? I mean, yeah, you want to address all air leaks, but is this the time to to look for the you know to kind of go one step at a time and see what alleviates it, or is it just a signal to you guys time to air seal my entire attic floor? I think it's. I think that's where you start. Like, okay. Likely this is um, a warm, moist air coming into um, the attic. So where is that coming from? So then just look around and start creating a, a list of what are the, the the largest culprits. And one thing likely is uh, that attic access. Yeah, the hatch. Um, yeah. Whether it's a hatch and or door or door, um, that's probably the largest hole <laughs> in your thermal boundary. Yeah. Um, and very rarely are they air sealed and insulated. That's an exterior door. That's next to your door. Yeah. Yeah. And typically there's like that little thin piece of Luon almost on those hatches. Um, super leaky. Um, it's a piece of plywood or a piece of drywall. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and so we can talk a little bit maybe about how to air seal that specifically. But then it is like Justin had mentioned, go and looking to be sure that there's not other huge penetrations can like lights. can lights. Those are big. Those, those are, are biggie. Big. Yeah. Um, or in and around the bathroom, not even if it's the exhaust fan itself, but um, that pe that penetration yeah. around the, the fan is yeah. that sealed. Chimneys. Chimneys. Uh, the chimneys is another big, big, big one. one for sure. And they, I, I, in their, I, actually they're not, <laughs> I wouldn't say they're hard to air seal. But it's sort of like you got to figure it out. You got to use metal strips. You got to use goopy caulk, and it's it's not a pretty job, but it's doable. So can we take these one at a time? Yeah. Because yeah. I think sure. you know, in order for this to be a standalone episode, and some people have heard us talk about this stuff before, but let's just let's hammer through them. So okay. first, air sealing around the chimney. Okay. Um, typically, you're going to have if it's a masonry chimney, it's coming up through the floor framing, and the floor framing is held back a certain number of inches per coat. Yeah. And so you're not allowed to put stuff between the framing and the the chimney by code. I mean, yeah. If you uh, mm, so mm. <laughs> non I, non combustible. Well, that's you're not allowed to put combustible. I don't right. Mm. It's mm. yeah. <laughs> that's why you hold the back. I have whatever the code is two Listen, and a half this, three inches that you hold the framing I, back. This is where I some uh, this is an awkward spot for me because my best advice is. Even if the code tells you not to put something there, I think you should put something there. Well, you can put something there that you know is going to be yeah, safe, and I that is some, likely some mineral wool. Mineral wool. You cannot light mineral wool on fire. Okay. I don't care how right. hot that chimney gets. So that's an option. Um, and, but and somebody, also that's fiber you know, insulation. That's not going to air seal you completely. Exactly. So what Brian, I think you <clears throat> had done in your attic is yeah. you actually got um, was it just coil stock? Some coil stock. Well, tell us about what you did. Yeah, well, that, and, and what's coil uh, stock for people who yeah, don't? Yeah, some flashing material that comes in a, a roll. Yep. Um, and I, you know, I basically cut lengths. What width did you get? And what color was it? <laughs> was it galvanized? I, I believe it. 
It was not colored. Do you remember the price? Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a serious question. Oh. <laughs> because <laughs> because I want to know What's, how big of the gap that you were trying to cover and how big was the leg that you, you – did you yeah, bend a leg the, into it? What are those widths? Three inches? The, the smaller rolls? No, they got to be bigger than that. Four or five know. inches? Okay. I think it's probably a five-inch roll, the smaller ones. It's a lot of rolls yeah. that they offer. Okay. So, well, okay. it was probably about five inches. So you don't need a lot. You, you don't, don't need, need a lot. something super wide. In my – you know, when, when I did it in my place, the – the chimney was not centered in that opening. So like, it was actually very close to the framing on one side and yeah. far from it on the other side. And um, and so basically I bent that stuff similar to how you would bend flashing, you know, with the same kinds of cuts and, you know, not being so concerned about, uh, um, obviously not being concerned at all about water, keeping water out, but I was I did want to get the, the metal tight enough around the corners so that I could then seal it with some fire rated intumescent yep. caulk. Yeah. So, so you so you cut these long strips, the yep. width of the framing essentially. Yep. And you just put one upturned leg in it. One upturned leg onto the chimney. That just rested against like I guess you underbent it so it would kinda almost compress exactly itself against the uh the chimney and then you just screwed it to the framing or I, nailed, I nailed it to the framming. It to the framing and I and, and then I just put smeared a bunch of stuff. Of off caulk and pressed that into it okay. and, and then just really gooped the edges yep. and um, so, you're bend yeah. it, you, so you bend it beyond 90 degrees so that it's kind of sprung against the masonry is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's right. And no fasteners there? No fasteners at the – I didn't use any fasteners at the um, chimney. I did this last year, so it's been through a, you know, it's been through a you know, cold cycle and a hot summer, so I should go up there and see how, yeah. see how that – uh, the the connections hell have held up. But I recall when you were doing this work, did you do this work in the winter or was it? It was last fall. Oh, so yeah. okay, so it was relatively cold, right? Yeah. And didn't you just you were getting like blasted with hot air, right? Oh, through amazing. that chase. I had to take my yeah. <laughs> I was up there in my unconditioned attic, working in you know sweatshirts and long sleeve stuff. And when I was working around the chimney, I had to get down to a t shirt. That's how much heat air loss was, was actually just, like, happening around that the chimney. Thing. Yeah. It was like confirming what I was doing, and like yeah. as, as as much as I didn't want to do that job, as goopy and messy as it was, and you know, it's just like got to do this. This is pretty, pretty becoming yeah. pretty clear right now. So that's yeah. a huge one. Yeah, that's cool. That's, and that's huge. I think that's just. I mean, whether or not you, I mean, you want to get into the conversation of using mineral oil or not. I mean, I think that's a pretty tried and true method just to use that flashing. And I think we, be cool. I think we have that in an article by Mike Gurton, don't yeah. we? Yeah, that I think, technique. I yeah. think that's where I got it from. Air sealing an attic or something like that. Um, did you put any insulation around it? I didn't. You just air sealed. Yeah, I mean, I think ideally you would like to, right? Well, yeah, it's it's yeah. just yeah. sort of a. I mean, it, it's one of those things. You know, yeah. you know what I say, Rob. Know the rules before you break them. I'm yeah, a did, you I want just, a continuous thermal boundary, I right? Just no weak spots. Not to. It's you know, there's nothing rated for it. I don't believe. Except for mineral wool. Well, mineral will not burn, so I just don't. But is it is it actually is it allowed? Uh, probably not. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know. know. I haven't looked at the. We'll look there was up. fiberglass stuffed in there when I started the project, and that had oh, been yeah. there for you yeah. know for yeah. sixty or seventy years. Well, in yeah, the, house the outside of, down. The, of the freaking masonry chimney is not gonna <laughs> yeah. be that hot. So, uh, <laughs> all right, the next biggest culprit, or maybe whatever, vice versa, but uh, that attic hatch. Yeah. How would you? Uh, I guess there's a variety of ways you can actually buy. I think like insulated hatch covers. You can, but. Maybe unnecessary. Oh, one last thing. Before, oh, yeah, sorry, I meant to say this before we moved off of the, the chimney is prepare yourself for some sticker shock when you go buy intumescent caulk. It's expensive, but don't don't get the cheap stuff because it the point of intumescent caulk is is that it will survive a fire. Like it, and other caulks will just fall apart. So like you that's an important chunk of money to spend on the right stuff. I just wanted to point that out. Okay. Um so anyway, so the attic hatch. Attic hatch. Yeah. Okay, first option, buy a product. There are some. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily, but if you go buy an attic hatch, an off-the-shelf attic hatch, it's not necessarily designed to be airtight. You can certainly buy products that are really good. They're, like their goal is to be a super energy efficient attic hatch, mm. but not all attic hatches are that. I mean, certainly the oh, one right. I had growing up was just it was just a wood door with a drop-down staircase. Right. I was thinking of the products that you actually just put above your existing. Yeah. Oh, like the dome thing? Yeah. yeah like you get above deal. your existing attic. Yes, yeah, so that's one yeah. way to do it. Just build a – either buy one of those big foam foam domes Yeah. or build one. Uh, out of rigid, rigid foam. foam. Um, you could also uh, add like glue rigid foam to the back – to the top side of the hatch to add our value to it. And yeah, I don't then, know how you would do that with the um, – Usually the access, like the the fold up ladders. Oh, you wouldn't be able to do it with that. Right. Yeah, I was. I guess I was thinking of 
the style where oh yeah i know what you're talking about where you're just pushing up a panel and setting it aside so that you can climb up oh okay yeah those are yeah those are easier yeah those are easier you just uh, yeah glue a bunch of rigid foam up to it and make sure you could either weather strip that yeah or, weather strip it and yeah. i and my vote for that would be to use the the cushiest compressible weather stripping you can get mm. um another we talked about this before but uh what is it conservation technologies Tech conservation technologies that the name of the company they advertise with us and they have awesome insulation products that are hard to find like air sealing strips and like perfect little gaskets and things for these jobs and they're super easy to talk to and they'll they'll be like nope you need this i'll get you 20 feet of it it'll cost this we'll have it to you in a couple of days like they're, they're an awesome resource but you want it to be as cushy as possible because that door is not it's not on a hinge it's not like a regular door when you close a regular door it swings and it latches and it compresses the only thing you're going to have working for you in this situation is the weight of the panel itself if it's one of the panels that you're just resting by its own gravity so you, so you need the weight of whatever you're putting on there to compress the air seal and that might mean that you want that hatch to be a little heavier like maybe it's two layers of three quarter inch plywood mm-hmm. uh whatever the balance is of this is easy enough for me to lift out of the way but heavy enough to make a good seal i guess that's that would be my advice there um and uh yeah, I mean, those are kind of the tried and true methods. There's a lot of products you can buy. Yeah. I'm sure I'm sure you can buy a kit that's like you just replace yeah. the door I and it's air sealed. My house has the right conditions to have access from the outside. Yep. And the attic is nothing but an insulated insulated floor. Yep. So I actually just sealed mine into place and put in a... The interior in a, access, you just sealed the place? The interior access, I just sealed it with spray. I, put, I insulated the top of it with yep. rigid foam, and then I just spray foamed it right into place. If you really needed to bust the roof, you could probably, yeah. but it's not no fasteners. Right. Um, want to make sure you cut that hole inside of the house before you do that. Yes. <laughs> and I put a, put a little access door up in one of the gable walls. Make sure the ladder's up. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, but I had the right conditions for that. You, know, yeah. you only have to go up a ladder, you know, one story to get to that door. And, right. And the beauty um, of it is that door doesn't have to do anything except keep keep nature out. It doesn't, yeah. it doesn't have to be air sealed. Right. It doesn't have to. Just, have to yeah. just got to keep the critters out. Yeah, and I don't have keep mechanicals nature. up there. And I don't have much yeah. reason to go up there yeah. unless, you know, one of the can lights fails or something. The, but, uh, the real hardcore energy efficient guys will, will, will give you the advice of just – seal the attic the attic is not for storage it's not for it's not for for anything but insulation yeah and so that's the extreme yeah but a lot of people you know house i grew up and we needed it we christmas decorations up there everything was up there yeah yeah what about you've mentioned mechanicals so um what about ductwork that's running up there wait before we can i ask a question no rob's trying to move us along we're not done i know how do you build you, you guys both mentioned that you could build something yeah how do you detail that to actually be airtight? Uh, are there are there some ways to build your own rigid foam dome that would be actually? Well, airtight? I can't build a dome. I can't okay. build you a dome. I can build you a box. Box. I got so I can grab a, a couple sheets of rigid foam. Uh huh. Um, if you're if this rigid foam is acting as your air sealing and your insulation, it's got to be a, a decent amount of R value. I mean, yeah. the best case is it's the same amount of R value as the rest of the insulation, and that's pretty high. Uh, you know, and then you you go from there and you compromise as as you see fit. You know, it's like it's likely going to be less than the rest of your attic if your attic is really well insulated. Um, and you essentially can just using a table saw or a hand saw or a, or a long utility knife cut the pieces to make a rectangle box. And so, it, essentially, a a box that you make out of rigid foam and then you turn it upside down and drop it over the opening. Mm-hmm. As you're going down the ladder to leave the attic, you just place it down. But in order to put it together, um, I've had pretty good luck with just um, like house wrap tape, uh-huh. just taping the parts together and and spray foam, foaming them from the inside once they're assembled. So like you make the box with tape and then you flip it over and, and then seal the interior joints with, with a bead of spray foam to make it airtight. Um, do you do it differently? No, that's all. That's all He's great. I was about curious it. about the connection yeah. of that to, oh, to the floor oh, plan and to stuff the floor like that. Where it's yeah. sitting. Is that sorry? Just, that's why is I that might, the best you can do. I, and I'd probably just consider to similar that? to like what Justin was talking about. I might consider building that box. I mean, an insulated plywood box, so you have the weight, and then you could either have bucks around the opening that are then weather stripped, so that when you drop and you know hinge it, whatever you have to do, so that when you do drop it down, it'll it'll be air. It's sealed. A little bit. Yeah. Maybe you could put it on a gasket. Maybe yeah. you have to make like a little chamber up there. Maybe you need to like walk up there and then 
out of a little breezeway and into the rest of your an attic. airlock. An airlock. I, I don't. I don't like the plywood. I mean, sorry. I don't like the the box method. I just don't. I, you'd have to do it, like you said, if you if you have one of those staircase drop down yeah. things. But you know, I, I'm also fine without the staircase thing. How often are you going up there? You know, it's I can pull out a step ladder and go up to the attic well, if I need you, to. If you've got a bunch of yeah. I don't know. Yeah. yeah I, I, a lot of stories, a lot of stuff up there. If we did you. cartoons in the magazine, we could do one with uh, someone putting an exterior door <laughs> yeah, <laughs> horizontally in their roof plane. Yeah. Right, it would work. be great. It would, it would be great. Right? You just yeah. go up and Why not? open the door, swing yeah. it open. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Latch it. <laughs> yes. Um, it, uh, I, if I had the choice, I would do the just the regular hatch cover and not the big box. Yeah. Um, but the other thing you were talking about ducks. Yeah. I just, I mean, I don't know how deep you want to get into it, but, um, you know, I got all day. <laughs> if you've got uh, ducks up there, hopefully they're insulated, you know, with that foil faced, I don't know what that R value is with that, uh, um, is R five or is it you more mean than the, that? The foil faced like fiberglass yeah. wrap. Yeah. So that, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean, and correct me if I'm wrong, that doesn't necessarily mean that those ducks are air sealed. Correct. Correct. So that could be a source of uh, moisture as well. A huge source. Yeah. Because yeah. uh, uh, I think sometimes people look at those ducts, they see that, all right, there's some foil stuff over them. They're airtight. That's cool. We're, no, we're that's good to just go. a sleeve that gets pulled over it. Yeah. It doesn't it, mean that all those connections, all those elbows. Um, in fact, it usually is an indication that <laughs> that's the only thing you've got that's sealing them. Yeah. Uh, um, you, sometimes they're rigid, by the way. Sometimes those ducts are made out of like rigid board uh, fiberglass insulation mm -hmm. and that is the the duct yeah um, but all that stuff can be sealed with like mastic which is just essentially a little bucket of goop yep. put on a put on a, a rubber glove and then a cotton glove over it that you're going to throw away dip your hand in there and then go to town just wiping it yeah it's like finger painting it's fun uh tape will work but i think the mastic tends to work better because chances are everything up in your attic is going to be dusty and dirty by now right. and you know you want to get a good goopy coating on there to seal it mm -hmm. um and uh yeah, that's that's an excellent, uh, excellent source of moisture, especially those returns that run through the the attic, because that's picking up all that moist air from your house and it's just right. running it right across the coldest area, yeah, and then back down again. Um, yeah, and I, some people go as far as to create insulated boxes around their mechanicals too, but yeah. that's kind of a different sure. different level. Yep. So those are the big. I think those are the big ones. Yeah. Yeah. Chimney, HVAC. Equipment, attic hatch. Yeah. Start there, and you, you're still getting this problem. Then start to maybe uh, dive down into the deeper stuff. Yeah. So I think the, the big takeaway for John is that I would not start with, is this a venting issue? There's right. a lot of other things that it probably is. Yeah. Uh, here's, a, here's an attic hatch that zips. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I've seen those. Yeah. Yeah. How much? Who makes it? Um, it says uh, Jolt. Power Jolt, Power Jolt Thermal <laughs> Radiant Hatchway Series, air seals and insulates, easy to install, high R value, saves energy, 160 bucks. Rigid foam is pretty expensive. It is. True. You get, you're getting close to that with your rigid foam and your but spray that's foam. that's not actually what was the R value of that thing. That's not R. That's not insulation. It's just a one of those foil faced. It says air seals and insulates. And yeah. It says high R value. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, no. So <laughs> let's see. I'll tell you what the R value is. It's like green washing. Yeah, power chill. I'm sold. Save ninety percent on your windows. <laughs> That's like that product. Uh, yeah, they don't give an R. Remember that product a while <laughs> ago? They were talking about that uh, that what, that spray paint that people were spraying oh, yeah. on the underside of their uh, yep. and they're trying to claim that it has an equivalent R value of like R forty or something like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they got shut down pretty quick. Yeah, pretty quick. Yeah, thirty dollars off right now. Um, <laughs> Promo code. Oh, that is the that is the thirty dollars off one fifty nine ninety five. Brian almost got sucked in. Yeah, and I wonder about the zipper too. I mean, maybe it air seals, but well, why wouldn't it? I mean, a zipper can be tight. Think about like a uh, like a hazmat suit or something. Oh, Those yeah. have zippers, don't they? Do they? When was the last time you put I mean, on a hazmat <laughs> suit? <laughs> the stack effect's pretty Earlier strong. Earlier today. I mean, think of all that you have to do to actually make a house airtight. You think that zipper's gonna bust? <laughs> I think air's gonna go right through it. Yeah. right through it. Sure. Sure. I think you can make sure a sealed zipper. Do you think they did? No, I don't <laughs> think they did. Sandra writes, this may be a relatively silly question compared to the deeper topics you guys usually cover, but I'm sort of a newbie remodeler, and I actually often find myself understanding the larger goals of a remodel but left confused over the stuff that everybody considers dirt simple basics. Case in point, 
I was buying supplies at the local big box store and turned down the fastener aisle. I was completely overwhelmed by the options. I know it's a broad question, but can you guys possibly chat a bit about fasteners in general and when to choose different kinds? I don't think that's a dumb question at it's all. It's a great question, especially because yeah. it's been such an exploding category in yeah, for it's a huge. while now. It's like the light bulb aisle now. Yeah. I don't even know what I'm looking at half the time. Right. Yeah. Uh, so how do we want to tackle this? I mean, should we limit ourselves to nails and screws or? I guess we're – I mean – it all comes down to the task at hand, right? I mean, you start to for sure like framing or but just uh, understanding exterior, interior trim, you know. Yeah, but just understanding stuff. what you're looking at. I mean, mm -hmm. um, that the exterior interior distinctions a, a good one, right? So uh, let's talk about coatings. Yeah, coatings. Um, at least in, for framing nails, you're going to see uh, bright nails. They actually say bright on the box, uh, and that's that's intended for interior use. Galvanized. All right, for exterior use, you, you mean you can use them interchangeably, but you're going to spend more. Not sorry, not interchangeably. You can use galvanized inside, but it would be a waste. You're spending a lot of money for, for something that you don't need to have. That's why. Um, that's why there's two two different types. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, for exterior screws, uh, you got all different coatings, right? Yeah. You have um, drywall screws will rust, so don't use those. Uh, you're going to see a lot of epoxy coated stuff. Those are good for exterior. Although some people complain that those coatings can chip off, especially if you drive it with an impact driver. Um, that's sort of a, I don't know what to tell you there. I'm sure it's some brands don't, some brands do. I don't, I can't give, we can't really, I don't feel comfortable giving overarching advice on that. Mm -hmm. Stainless steel obviously will be always a great choice outside. A little pricey, but. Pricey and uh, it can be soft. You might, right. if you don't get the right pilot holes and, and the right pilot hole being, you know, the root diameter of the screw, not the threads, but the, the shank of the screw. You drill a hole to that size so that the shank goes through with ease and the threads bite into the wood. So typically um, a, a little bit smaller than the... A little bit smaller than the, than than the, the widest point of the right. screw. Uh, and because um, if you don't do that, those stainless steel screws are, are a lot more likely to shear off while you're driving them in or deform... At, at the head with the uh, the driver bit. Um, when you get into... Uh, what, your, about, what about, I guess, does it matter head shape, you know, like, or yeah. bit? I mean... I think it matters. Totally matters. It especially matters, depending, uh, I guess, considering on um, the material that you're uh, screwing into, you know, like dense tropical hardwoods or stuff like that. Um also, how much, how visible do you want them to be? I mean, trim head screws, which are the smallest ones, are going to be, oftentimes they're left unfinished. Like you drive it through and, and sometimes the heads of the screws are colored mm -hmm. so that you could drive it in, drive it flush, and then, you know, step back 15 feet and it goes away visually. Yeah. You don't need to putty those holes. A lot of a lot of trim is put up that way. Um, As opposed to an opposite end of the spectrum would be a pan head. A pan head. Screw, which is great for... You know, something like cabinetry that you're holding to the wall yeah. and you want, a, you want a little bit of a surface area. You're, yep. you're going to keep it on the surface of the cabinetry to Also great for really it. thin materials because you don't yep. have enough depth to kind of bury that bugle head of the screw into the material. You want to just kind of pull it yeah. and hold it. Like pocket hole screws are that way. Yep. Certain uh, screws, um, I mean, they'll be bugle head, but they'll have these little ridges or these little cutting yeah. um, uh, ridges on beneath that head to kind of countersink as you drive that screw in, which is sometimes yeah. helpful. I think what those things are doing, at least in the decking category, is there's a lot of things going on in decking screws that are kind of meant to prevent the material from mushrooming up around the yeah. head, especially with synthetic decking. That's a problem. So mm -hmm. they're kind of like, as you're driving it in, it's almost like, cutting the material and pushing it down so that it ends up flatter at the surface. Hey, just a note from my own experience about particular, you mentioned pocket hole screws, but I might have mentioned this before, but particularly, <laughs> I mean, this coming. particularly the Craig pocket hole screws, they hold up outside. I know. I knew, I knew we were going there. They hold up outside. Oh, yeah. I've used them in exterior applications and they hold up. They don't, they stay shiny and bright. Outside. I know. I've had the same experience, but it's funny because they sell exterior Pocket yeah. hole screws. They're, they're like blue. Yeah. It's because they're protected in that pocket. No. I, I think I, so. I've used them where I've just left them oh, really? left them exposed, like not as pocket <laughs> screws, as like yeah. as a face screwed. To attach a deck ledger or something? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sure. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, right. but, no, but that's a good point, though. I'm glad you said that because I didn't even think about structural screws, which is kind of the the term that we've landed on for all of these, like timber lock and yeah. Simpson uh, SDS or whatever they. What do they call their screws? I forget now. Strong drive. Mm-hmm. Um, those are like replacements for lags and bolts. So they're like basically. Uh, so the difference between a lag and a bolt is a, a bolt slides through a clearance hole and has a, nut, a washer and a nut on the other side. A lag is like a big heavy duty screw with like a hex head on it, so you can drive it with a with a wrench or a, or a nut driver. Yeah. Um, these this kind of newest generation of structural screws does the heavy lifting of a lag or a bolt, but it can drive in itself without without tapping drilling a pilot hole. Yeah. So it speeds up a lot of things. It can make. <laughs> it just speeds up a lot of things. Yeah. They're awesome. They're great. Uh, and they just hold miraculously. Um, there's a lot of different varieties of those. Yeah. There's varieties that go into concrete. There's varieties. Well, I guess those aren't, those might not like strictly fall cons. under structural. No, I was thinking more like you get like certain GRK, which is one brand, or um, Spax. They have, uh, even Simpson, they have, uh, they have screws that are meant to be driven into concrete with a pilot hole right. that grip the concrete. So if you're doing like a, a post base for a column or if you're anchoring something to a wall that's heavy, uh, like a concrete wall. But, yeah, then you also have tap cons. Yep. Those are um, – those can be brittle. I, yeah, I have a bunch lot of, of struggles with tap cons. I, I have a real love-hate relationship with those things. I have a bunch of them, and I don't use them for a while because I get frustrated. And then I pull them out for a job, and I go, I'm going to make these work. And then I snap two of them off, and I go, I freaking hate these things. <laughs> And it's all for me. It's you're looking at me, Brian, like you have no problem with them at all. No, I've I've had the same experience. In fact, I I just find that the bits that they come with aren't the greatest. Oh, they're well, they're not good at all. And you wrestle to you wrestle to to actually you're working to, hard to drill a good <laughs> pilot hole, and then and then without a without a good pilot hole, they're just infuriating to work with. And if and if you have any dust in the bottom of that pilot hole. The screw will hit that and it will break. Right, you got to get the dust out. Yeah, yeah. exactly. They're just you, not. They don't have a lot of shear resistance. It seems they don't. like they snap off really yeah. quick. And so, on the, you know, it also depends on the concrete. Like, like really recently poured concrete is very like green concrete. Green concrete, it's so called, is very easy to to drill into. Yeah. If you're buying a house that's ninety years old and you want to put up a piece of wood in the basement, it's like you're going to be in for some drilling. You mentioned. Um, you know, Sandra is, is admittedly a, a newbie and doesn't know much, and you we we brushed past drywall screws pretty quickly. But I think for a lot of people who <laughs> don't know better, you know, um, it's a, it's always important to mention out that drywall screws screws are not meant to hold anything up but drywall. Yes, and yeah, if you're hanging a picture or something. Knock no. yourself out, but nah. if it, but not, but, but not but a heavy, not not a, not a, not a, not a, not a with a big frame <laughs> or a big frame yeah. or a mirror. It's or, amazing I mean, I think how it's many like, people still install cabinets with drywall screws. Yeah, and they're tempting for a lot of reasons. They're black. They're affordable. They're <laughs> there's so many reasons why they're tempting. Yeah. They seem like this multi-purpose screw, mm-hmm. right? And they're not. There's, I mean, as evidence from the aisle, and you, you get overwhelmed with the selections. I mean, there's I so think many. typically, yeah, you, you just kind of. You start to find some screws that you like, and you stick within that manufacturer yeah. or that what head you, type. What do you like? I like GRKs. So we didn't even get into the drive type. Is well, it we did. Sick? I mentioned that a little bit. Um, yeah, I'm done with drive types. <laughs> what do you mean? So many freaking bits now. And every, you know. <laughs> well, that's the other thing. Is that, that's the other thing is that I think when <laughs> I think when you when you start to find a screw that you like that has a certain head shape yeah. and bit type stick then with it stick with it because you're always going to have a little bit comes with that every yeah. package of screws and when you lose that one which you're going to um you'll have a bunch laying around yeah, yeah well we talked about head shape we didn't talk about the yeah like phillips or so, torques yeah. or star yeah. drive and yeah, yeah you I'm were complaining about, about this when you came to my shop yeah Brian. i just because i guess what happened was when when as as new types of screws came out with new drive types i didn't yet know that what rob just mentioned yeah. like that this was going to be an exploding thing and yeah. that i should be paying attention and so now i've you know i've built a deck with like four different drive types and, yeah. I, and I had to i had to you know t- take a this couple of treads off the stairs to to do something recently and it was like i needed to find it's pretty infuriating three different bits in, there, in, in the mountain of, of these little I mean, bits that i have i do like a square drive it compared to like I, yeah. it, grks are star drive but i do yeah. like square square drive bits i mean the thing is like i stay away from phillips head because phillips like the shape of a phillips head um bit i mean those are designed to cam out of the fastener under load under torque and so 
where star drives aren't. So you can yeah. have more control over it, you know, you over like the depth and even density of woods or density of materials or yeah. with an impact driver. I mean, those torque big star drive and square drive give you more purchase. And, yeah. yeah. You know. That's a great way to put it. Yeah. More purchase. Uh, how much does it piss you off when you encounter a, a slotted screw head at this point, though? Like, oh, yeah. Like, what oh, are we doing it's here? It's brutal to have to, like, because <laughs> there's no good driver bit to get it out. Like, oh. it's not made for that. You have to do it by hand to really. Yeah. It's just like, oh. Mm -hmm. So and I think the worst thing you can do is go to the store and buy one of these, like, all-in-one kind of assorted screw packages. It's, like, the worst of, of everything. Like, they're all, like, those shiny you know, they give you like four of each type and you can always tell like the homeowner screw kit. It's always like, it's all the little, the shiny nickel plated, like big mushroom pan head slotted screws that yeah. you're like, I hate, you know, they're just the worst. Um, but it's tough because if you want to get really good fasteners like GRK, they're expensive. They're pretty pricey. Yeah. Be, this, there's a good, I mean, what are your, there's a good app idea here. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Brian, that's after the show. But go ahead. The, fastener, the right fastener that you need. Get the fastener you need. There's a, you open up the app. You say, what What are you doing for work? You just drill down until it answers. Don't they do that in the aisle? I think much? they do, do it in the aisle. And I think it is. it comes down to personal preference. Like So I, I like GRKs. <laughs> I don't like SPACs. And they're Why do both, you not like SPACs? And they're both star drive. I just have gotten um, a lot of inconsistency in the packaging. So a lot of like Phillips head screws mixed in oh, with yeah. I've uh, some of that a lot too. of headless screws, a lot of deformed screws. And you're right. I've had that too. And I've been standing on a nine pitch roof that I've secured some cleating to with spack screws and just have them shear off. And All I was right, like, oh, really? sweet. So I'm not going to use these again. Well, Maybe people have had other experiences, but th those have been my experiences. Single-handedly puts backs out of business. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I know... Maybe people would um, say use the right screw for the job. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you shouldn't put those in with screws. Those shouldn't be holding you on the roof. Yeah, probably not. Maybe a lag. I guess. A, a lag. lag. Yeah. Yeah, Rob's not, Rob's yes. not suggesting that Yes, that, that, was, the, that, that was the appropriate use, but... Yeah. Your kids were fine. Um, <laughs> so, what are your? I mean, what is, what's your go-to? I mean, oh, I will... Sorry, I will mention that even their trim head screws are sweet. Uh, I found GRKs. Yeah, I, GRKs are really nice. Uh, you can pretty much only get them in lumber yards, or at least my lumber yard and um, most reputable lumber yards I've been to have them. And then I think Home Depot, at least the one in my area, has them. Yeah, Lowe's yeah, doesn't. Do. Uh, Lowe's Lowe's has SPACs, I think. I think you're right. Uh, they might have some other stuff. Yeah, um, but there's you can if if you're not every project demands those awesome screws though it, it, they're nice That's but true. when you have to buy a giant container of screws to screw down a subfloor or something mm -hmm. it's like it's a it can be a hard pill to swallow to spend all that money on the specs it's really nice but you know there's all sometimes you can buy a big bin of like like construction, construction screws, screws. Yeah. like, yeah. like yeah. even if they're Phillips head I mean that's fine too um, it, it's not the best to work with but uh, it's it can be a, it's it's a good trade off for cost. Well, you, and if you're doing something like you just mentioned, it's it's a lot it's of screws. Not, it, it's a lot of screws, and it's not finicky. You're not like you know installing cabinets on the wall where you need. Yep, to be, it's pre really precision. You're you're going around, and you're screwing down subflooring, and you have the time to. Can we talk about nails now? I like nails. You get because you got all different kinds. You got you know you got the they're so they're going to go by like the, the the penny system. So like. Six penny, eight penny, ten penny, and it's written as six D, eight D, ten D. For anybody who doesn't know that, and I guess the old wives' tale is that what was it like? You'd get that many nails for a penny or something. Yeah, is that what it was? Um, so that for some reason that system is still hanging on. I don't know why. Um, but but typically, like if you buy the little the little slight headed finish nails, they'll have like a little. Uh, concave area on the top that you know it's perfect for putting a nail set yeah, into so yeah, you hand the drive the nail and then you leave it just a little proud and then you finish it off with this perfectly centered nail punch swipe it's pretty satisfying yeah, um for sure uh you're gonna see uh ring shank nails which is intended to uh hold better yeah. like in uh resist withdrawal which is yeah. really typical for siding yeah you're gonna see a lot of that in siding you're also gonna the see spiral decking, nails spiral nails come deformed nails yeah those are common for uh for decking installation also for hand drive um you're gonna see duplex nails which are cool they're like double-headed nails and those are originally meant for concrete 
formwork guys because they would use nails to hammer the forms together for a concrete foundation, pour the foundation, and then they would have to easily yeah, grab all those nails out. and pull them out. So it gives you a little thing to hook your pry bar or, or claw of your hammer onto to easily disassemble things. It could be good for, but don't over, you know, you don't have to be a concrete guy. It could be good for making a temporary wall or, mm. or anything else that you need to assemble and then disassemble again. They're kind of handy to have at least a box of around. Um, what else we got? Um, cut nails are cool if you can find a, find a reason to use them. Um, they're really cool because they don't split the wood and they look badass when they're driven into the surface. Uh, and in a pinch, I've actually used masonry cut nails to make it look like wood nails, although they don't hold, mm. they don't hold as well. But masonry cut nails are the same basic idea. They're just like super hard nails yeah. that you can use to hammer into concrete. Um, yeah, the, the art of the art of hand driving nails. That's kind of gone away, huh? Sometimes I look you at gotta, like, you got to post a clip of Larry Hahn. Sometimes, well, not even just framing, but sometimes I see like like we we bitch about like the troubles of fitting a cope joint and crown. Try fitting it holding it with one hand and right. hammering it with yeah. the other. Yeah. And that's, that, that's, and like, you know, that's really I, true. like often I've got it like just delicately positioned and then I can like just pull the trigger lightly yeah. and just like get the nail in. Like this, you gotta, you gotta have it secure enough that you're gonna hammer yeah. it. <laughs> Think about all that stuff that like, you know, you've got like these pin nailers now. So all your yeah. little mitered returns and all those little delicate, you know, trim applications is like, yeah, like. They just didn't do a lot yeah. of them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or they pre-drilled holes or they split a lot of stuff <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so don't overlook nails obviously we could get into pneumatic nails but that's not really the question here so hopefully that gives you at least a primer to get we probably just started. over some more so uh, sorry about that i got um, a i got a big box of galvanized 10 inch spikes if you need them sandra just let me know <laughs> Great. Brian, 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 little, i'm trying to get rid of this a brian, for years. brian put a little giveaway <laughs> special that a, a hydraulic cement everybody uh. yeah <laughs> Man. I'll keep the hydraulics, man. <laughs> he loves that. Love yeah, that stuff. Awesome. <laughs> all right. That's going to wrap us up. We'll talk to you guys all next week. Thanks for listening. Um, if you like the show, please spread the word. Tell a friend. Uh, give us a review on iTunes. And uh, definitely check out the website, findhomebuilding.com slash podcast, where you'll see, again, the show notes and, and a whole lot more. Um, until next week, this is Justin for Brian and Rob saying keep craft alive and happy building.